Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the afternoon session of the last day. Um, our first speaker will be Chris Despori of Microsoft Quantum, who will be talking about developing for quantum today and tomorrow. Go ahead, Krista. Okay, mic's on. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I uh, hope you had a good, good break and some good food. How many people got the high fidelity Mexican today? <laughs> yeah, good. Two nines, not quite high enough fidelity, right? Um, so I'm excited to be here today. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I've been on a bit of a hiatus from uh, technical conferences and workshops the last almost two years, uh, dealing with a, a fine young lady named Daisy, who is growing up reading Chris Gary's books. So I expect within the year she'll be programming Q Sharp uh, out of our home. Um, so I'm excited to be here today to talk about how we're developing for quantum today and tomorrow. And I think this is a really great workshop that's come together. And it's a great mix uh, of theory, uh, you know, different programs, and then also you know, different advances in hardware. I'm excited to see the community coming together. Great opportunity to talk across boundaries, across disciplines, and uh, you know, all come together and work to kind of co-optimize and co-develop our quantum future. So today I'm not presenting uh, much of my own work, uh, which, is, which, uh, which is a new experience. I want to thank uh, all of the people from my team who have really contributed. Uh, this is the set of people whose work I'm going to represent today. I want to thank all of them in advance for the, for the great work that I'm able to speak about. Uh, and also you should you know, take this as a caveat that I may not be able to answer all of your detailed technical questions. Uh, on the work to come. So first of all, I, I, I'm the general manager of quantum systems at Microsoft. And the Microsoft, uh, really, you know, our focus and our mission is to develop and deploy a scalable commercial quantum system and ecosystem that's going to enable us to really solve you know, some of today's hardest challenges, some of today's unsolvable problems. And this, of course, is a grand goal. Right? And one all of us in this room you know, are likely thinking about and hoping for and dreaming of. Uh, so it's exciting to be you know, at a company that's really investing in this space and bringing together you know, the diverse set of skills, of people, of technologies that we need uh, to actually deliver on a scalable, you know, scalable quantum computer. And then, of course, to identify those applications. Uh, so at Microsoft, we're really thinking about the whole stack. We're working uh, not only on the algorithms and the software that I'll focus on today, but also on the hardware uh, and working on all of the things in between, right? The interconnect, control, materials, you know, many of the things we've heard about over the last two days. I want to focus today on the algorithms and the programming environments that will enable us to get through the NISC era and beyond. Uh, so of course, we've seen lots of, lots of great applications come along uh, uh, you know, since, since you know, uh, Shor's algorithm back in 1994. Right? We've seen many, many new opportunities for quantum computing to make a difference. These span areas such as chemistry uh, and materials, you know, where we hope maybe Quantum computing can have an impact on helping, uh, you know, what we think of as catalyst problems, right? How can a quantum computer help us uh, create a better, you know, more efficient chemical reaction? And such problems could lead to, you know, more efficient fertilizer production, potentially even mitigating global warming, looking at carbon capture problems. Uh, of course, materials is a great area for uh, quantum computing where we hope to uh, study exotic properties of materials on a quantum computer, you know, much more efficiently than we can do classically. And there, of course, you know, possible applications might be, uh, you know, identifying such a material and then being able to cable it and then having something like lossless power lines or better batteries, right? And then also, you know, we want smarter materials, of course. Um, you know, are there ways to make paint dry faster? <laughs> Things like that, right? Uh, and then in machine learning, of course, this is a a big area uh, classically right now, and there's open questions as to how quantum will impact machine learning. 
There have been results showing faster training, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot of dequantizing of machine learning applications. Uh, but there's still, you know, still the case that quantum models can uh, offer exponentially you know, better models um, when you're studying in, in particular over quantum data. So there are very interesting scenarios for machine learning. And then, of course, in optimization, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the talk today. Uh, they're, you know, hoping, we've heard about a little bit about QAOA and VQE and other areas, but, you know, optimization applications have a potential to be impacted by, by quantum, quantum systems and quantum computers. And then, of course, there's a whole other uh, array of areas, uh, which, you know, John touched on briefly, uh, well, for most of his talk yesterday, um, other applications uh, falling outside of the ones I just mentioned. Everything from you know, quantum safe privacy, QKD, there's a lot of quantum sensing applications where we can hope for you know, improved um, accelerometers, uh, applications in biology and medicine. You know, quantum games are fun to think about. And then of course there's quantum speed ups uh, that can be had in semi-definite programming and in linear systems of equations. But again, some of those are being dequantized as well. So it's great to keep looking for these applications. So with all of these applications, uh, what I want to think about and talk about today is really you know, our NISC era. And what should we be looking at during the NISC era as we you know, move through the NISC era um, from both the hardware side and what I'll consider you know, the software and apps side. So, We've, we've seen a couple talks, I think, you know, Chris Monroe's talk yesterday and then, you know, several other uh, hardware-based talks. And this is a snapshot, you know, it's, it's amazing how old this graph is now, <laughs> 2013. We're already in 2019. But this is, you know, essentially a snapshot from Devery and Shulkoff's paper showing the improvements in this case of uh, transmon or superconducting qubits, of course. Uh, so we have you know, what, what some have called the Shulkoff law or, uh, you know, a quantum, uh, you know, could this be a quantum Moore's law? So I think one question on the hardware side is, you know, can we actually exhibit it either through, you know, fidelities or numbers of qubits, do we have a quantum Moore's law? Are we, are we scaling hardware in that manner? Um, and, you know, how quickly can we improve the lifetimes, push the lifetimes, um, push the numbers of qubits? while maintaining you know, some of these metrics that we heard about earlier today uh, under, you know, say, quantum volume, right? Looking at all these different aspects of the system and making sure that those are all you know, remaining you know, good under some set of metrics. Uh, so it's interesting to think whether or not we have a quantum Moore's law. Uh, so we can talk about that at coffee break. But what I think is really fascinating, and of course, you know, take this with the, the asterisk that I'm a computer scientist coming from a theory background, um, algorithmic advances outperform Moore's law. So while we are pushing really hard in the NISC era, you know, pushing on the hardware, improving the error rates, improving, um, you know, the numbers of qubits, we have to do that, no question. But we have to continue to push on the algorithms <coughs> because algorithmic advances do outperform Moore's law. This is true classically. I guarantee you it's true quantumly. And without pushing from both directions simultaneously and really doing that during the NISC era, you know, I don't believe we're going to plow through the NISC era together, right? So to do it, we need to push from both directions. Um, and these algorithmic advances can be very, very substantial, right? So, you know, I mean, we've seen that just with the talk of dequantizing quantum algorithms, right? There's, there's a kind of pressure um, or advancement, you know, that you could say uh, really bumps off this graph. Um, but, you know, for a given class of algorithms, we really need to advance them and optimize them. So let's talk about how we do that. In terms of developing quantum applications, you know, the first thing we need to do is come up with a quantum algorithm. And that quantum algorithm should come with a quantum speed up. Uh, now, in the NISC era, maybe that quantum algorithm, you could argue, comes with a you know, a, a, an estimated quantum speed up when run in practice, right? Uh, that you think it's going to, you know, a heuristic, not provable necessarily, uh, that you think will be better. You know, I think that equally will fit uh, in this model. So you come up with a quantum algorithm that you think has quantum speed up or provably has quantum speed up. 
Uh, and you know, there, you know, from a workforce development standpoint, many of us are coming from you know university. Uh, we need to think about how we can train more people to think about quantum algorithms. Now, uh, from there, you want to confirm that this quantum speedup exists, right? So, when you take that quantum algorithm, if you just have a complexity-based result, uh, you then need to drill into that quantum algorithm, right? And identify that when you implement those oracles, when you map it, you know, when you go through synthesis and layout or error correction, what are those? You know, what's what's that ultimate cost, right? What's the actual resource cost, numbers of qubits, operations uh, of that of that algorithm? And you know, on that you know along the, that process, you want to optimize that code until the runtime is you know essentially short enough to fit on your device. So this is this is a set of steps we should be doing in the NISC era, trying to really you know uh, push uh, different algorithms or application ideas onto the hardware available at the given time. Uh, but also to identify, you know, what size future hardware will be necessary to run a given application. Uh, so you do that, and then you need to embed it onto the specific hardware, right? That includes mapping it to the constraint graph uh, that one has in the hardware, uh, looking at the instruction set that you have available on the hardware. You know, ion traps have molnar Sorensen gates. You know, others, like in the topological <coughs> system we work on at Microsoft, it's measurement-only based. Right? So we need to compile and synthesize and translate and then embed to that actual quantum hardware and through that whole process, make sure that we still have a quantum advantage. So these are important steps that we need to be taking today. And then of course, under that, we need tools to be able to do this easily. And I'll talk more about that uh, towards the end of my talk. So a good example of this is uh, in quantum chemistry, this is really a a very broad collaboration with many people uh, where some members of my team uh, with colleagues at, at various uh, universities uh, together looked at you know, the chemistry algorithm we had. And, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, but I think it's a great example of really drilling into the optimizations on quantum algorithms that we need to be doing. So the classical algorithm, you know, essentially it's intractable to study the ground state energy uh, of, for example, the Fumoko molecule. And this is, this is a, um, a complex within, uh, within, you know, this is, Fumoko is a, um, a complex within this microbe that's in the earth uh, that is, you know, efficiently doing nitrogen fixation. Okay, and we wanna study this because this is actually the, uh, this molecule is doing nitrogen fixation when we do this process, um, uh, in, our, in, our, in our factories today, we use an industrial process, the Haber-Bosch process, uh, which is very, very expensive. And yet this, this microbe in the earth does it incredibly efficiently. So if we could model that, you know, maybe industrially, we could mimic what that microbe does and, uh, and then have a more efficient industrial process. Uh, so, you know, modeling this molecule is of extreme interest um, to chemists and to companies uh, around the world. So modeling that classically is essentially intractable, right? Now, if we took the quantum algorithm, polynomial time quantum algorithm, uh, back in 2012, we took that algorithm, ran it through, you know, really drilled into it, and said, what are the, what's the real cost of this when you go down to the, you know, the gate level, uh, the qubit level? And when you, you know, assigned a, you know, I, I think it was like 100 nanoseconds, but I'll have to double check the clock rate we assigned here that was assigned, uh, but it comes out to 30,000 years, right? So this is a polynomial time algorithm, but you know, we all know polynomials, you better look at the degree, right? It's nice to have a polynomial time algorithm, but if the degree is too large, then you're in trouble. Uh, so you know, when you plow this through, you get 30,000 years. That's not a killer application for a quantum computer, right? But now it is. By optimizing that algorithm, better mathematical bounds, right? From the theory side, push the bounds, uh, make them better. From you know, the software side, run it in practice. See what you're getting compared to the, what the bound says, right? And, and see, how do I reorganize the algorithm? How do I change the circuit structure? Uh, and together, you know, those types of optimizations coming together, um, many different people on the team, different skills, different backgrounds coming together we're able to drill down 30,000 years to one and a half days. And now this is one of the killer applications we're thinking about for a quantum computer. 
right? This is outpacing hardware Moore's Law, right? Mm -hmm. This is great. This is the type of thing um, I'm hoping our community can do more of. Uh, so it's pretty exciting, and of course this came through many different things, and, and I'm uh, just reiterating the point that really software engineering and this algorithm optimization is really essential. Now, of course, this algorithm is not going to be applied in the NIST era, um, but ideas coming from this algorithm might be, and it definitely sets us up for like the path, you know, where we're headed, motivation for where we want to go uh, together. Now, turning from, you know, optimization of algorithms to literally quantum optimization, um, uh, I want to now talk about you know, what we can learn from seeing what's happened, you know, what, what can we learn during the NISC era from just watching the evolution of quantum optimization? So in quantum optimization, you know, I think there's a lot we can learn here. And what we've witnessed, you know, in some sense you could argue that quantum optimization has become kind of a hot, hot area in, in the broader field of quantum computing and and actually in the broader field of classical optimization, you know, much because of the NISC era in some sense, uh, because D-Wave put out a device, noisy qubits, lots of them, certain connectivity. <coughs> and, you know, I remember being in Santa Barbara, um, I don't know, this must have been like six or seven years ago, John Martinez, Matthias Troyer, Dave Wecker, a bunch of people in a room, and it was right after D-Wave announced this device and said that they had speed ups on certain problems. And people began to ask, you know, together, that group of people began to ask, what is this device? Is it quantum? What kind of problems will it actually outperform? You know, can it outperform classical algorithms for, uh, for certain problems? And uh, what do those problems look like? You know, and out of that came a series of papers that, you know, many of you probably know about, uh, studying the D-Wave device and identifying <laughs> Uh, if it can outperform classical algorithms. And so, you know, the progress in this space is much due to the fact that there was a device that one could start studying. And out of that, we've gotten incredible value. So we've got new classical algorithms that outperform the previous state-of-the-art classical algorithms and are giving value today, right? Giving new results, new solutions. Uh, so I think this is exciting. So in terms of uh, uh, optimization, right, simulated annealing, you're doing thermal fluctuations in your algorithm and you have some schedule to reduce temperature. Uh, in the, uh, it, when you're doing a pure quantum annealing, you know, you're using quantum tunneling as that mechanism. And then we can talk about what we call quantum inspired optimization, uh, where you're essentially, you know, you're doing something in between. You're inspired by the quantum process uh, and you update your algorithm accordingly. Now there's a whole variety of quantum inspired optimization algorithms that we're not gonna get into, uh, but let's just take these three you know, rough, uh, rough categories or classifications of, of these optimization algorithms. Now, uh, this has been a hot topic, you know, uh, mainly focused on binary, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, uh, mostly in part because this is what maps well to quantum optimizers we have today. Um, for example, D-Wave uh, maps well to these Cubo problems. These are computationally very hard. We're not expecting exponential improvements here. We're, we're you know, expecting um, just improvements either in constants or slopes, which I'll speak to. And there's a nice mapping of optimization problems to this formulation. Now, uh, there's been you know, a lot of success on these quantum-inspired optimization algorithms. So a few years ago, uh, the MaxSat competition. So here, you want to solve the MaxSat problem. So take, you know, the satis uh, satisfiability problem, and you want to find the maximum number of clauses that's satisfied, uh, and, you know, use optimization algorithms to solve that problem. And interestingly, uh, now at the time they weren't Microsoft employees, but now they are, uh, Helmut Katzgraber and his colleagues uh, had an entry into this MaxSat competition, a quantum-inspired optimization algorithm. Stephen Jordan and Brad Lackey had an entry. Um, Diffusion Monte Carlo is actually the fifth place uh, solution here. You know, and in, in all these cases, these quantum in, you know, this quantum-inspired optimization algorithm called Borealis on this slide uh, was, the, it was the winner. 
in terms of solving max set. And so this, uh, this shows that these algorithms can be successful at certain problems. And when we look at these quantum optimizers, you know, what we're really looking for, uh, whether it's a full quantum solution or a quantum inspired solution, or a classical, you know, full class, what we might think of as kind of the traditional simulating, annealing classical solution, uh, we really want it to perform the best algorithm that you can run on CMOS, or you could go a step further, run it on, you know, FPGA, GPU, right? You could optimize it further onto real classical hardware. And this goes to something John was talking about yesterday. Uh, it's really important when we compare our quantum solutions that we compare to the absolute state-of-the-art classical solution. And that may be hardware that's further optimized than just the, you know, the core on your PC. It may be hardware that, you know, actually is going to exist five or ten years from now when we have a size quantum computer, you know, uh, com competing against it. So we have, to, we have to throw all we can from the classical side at the problem and compare to that benchmark. Uh, and when we say faster, you know, in these problems we're looking at either a better scaling with the size of the input, right, so uh, changing the slope of the line, uh, log log plot here, um, or we want to achieve a huge constant offset. If that constant's like a billion, this is huge, right? This is a, a huge win, a huge cost savings, uh, especially for companies that are running, uh, running these optimizations all the time. Um, and so we're really looking, you know, also then for better performance. And of course, when we look at these things, it's important to note, uh, and I think, you know, this is true for the whole NISC era as we looked at benchmark systems. Remember that any claim for speed up is really depending on that benchmark that you're running. Uh, so running it on a different benchmark, it might completely change the landscape of, you know, which algorithm is performing the best. <coughs> So here's, um, here's a plot on how these different optimization algorithms perform. So here we have QA is the D-Wave 2 quantum annealer. And then simulated SA is simulated annealing. That's your classical thermal fluctuation-based algorithm. And then QMC is a simulated D-Wave machine on classical hardware, so running on CMOS. Okay, so that's quantum, quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, and here, what we're looking at is the time to solve as a function of the number of variables uh, in the problem. And what you can see is, you know, from this plot, you can say, you know, quantum annealing achieves, I think, an, uh, 10 to the 8, is there 8 zeros? Yeah, 10 to the 8 speed up over CMOS, which would be pretty incredible, right? But it's important, again, to look at the benchmark you're running on and also look more closely at the scaling here. So this is a synthetic benchmark problem. And you can ask also, you know, how do other algorithms perform? You know, we saw these, uh, like this Borealis and some other algorithms on the MaxSat problem uh, just a few slides back. So when we take this, uh, take all of these algorithms, uh, you know, just don't worry about which algorithm is which too much here. Um, just look at kind of the spaghetti on the slide. Uh, the ones to highlight, quantum Monte Carlo in green, simulated annealing in that bright, that bright red uh, with the circles, uh, and then the D-Wave machine, that dark blue at the bottom, right? So those three match the curve we just saw. Um, but what's important to note is when we throw up, say, Borealis, a quantum-inspired optimization algorithm onto this plot, uh, that's this purple, it's overlaid by a blue triangle line, uh, but that's this purple line here. Uh, you can see that it performs pretty well, right? Now, when you, it, it's a lot easier to see if we now extract the slope of these lines. And so, you know, let's ask how this, how this is going to perform asymptotically as the, as the problem size grows. If you look at the slope of the line, uh, which is represented in this plot here, of course, smaller in this, in this plot is better. Uh, then you can see that these algorithms are performing extremely well and better asymptotically uh, than your quantum annealer. Now here's sequential. Uh, sequential means, uh, so on the left-hand side we have this orange box. Uh, sequential means you have some control parameter, uh, this high temperature that you sequentially reduce to a target value. Uh, and then on the right-hand side we have Taylor, 
What that means is the algorithms are taking advantage of the problem structure. So they're not generic, they've been tailored to the problem at hand. And so they might work really well for this problem, but they're not gonna work great for another problem. So in some sense it's, it's cheating, but if that's the only problem you're gonna run on, sure, it's probably okay. <laughs> um, but if we wanna look for a generic algorithm that we can apply to many, uh, many similar problems, that's this not tailored box. And what you can see there is the quantum inspired optimization method, Borealis, uh, performs extremely well. Um, and so, yeah, bottom line is that uh, quantum inspired algorithms, uh, you know, outperform these quantum annealing systems. So, uh, these algorithms work well when you have a problem that's not, you know, your nice convex optimization problem. Uh, so the, that upper plot is very much what we have in, in typical machine learning problems, right? Where it's, you can do gradient descent, it works, works pretty darn well to find that minimum. Um, but instead it's problems that have, you know, pretty high, uh, high barriers, very jagged landscape, lots of local minima, and, and you wanna, you know, try to find a good one. Uh, so, you know, a rugged high dimensional cost function landscape is the type of problem where QIO, these types of optimization algorithms work, work very well. Uh, typically, you know, large numbers of variables, not too large. Um, and then uh, you can also evaluate that cost function efficiently. So that's where they work pretty well. Uh, and in these things, you know, it's important to recognize, I, I worked in uh, machine learning at Microsoft for a long time. You know, a 1% improvement is huge. You know, for companies, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a big, Big difference. So, um, you know, from a research perspective, sometimes we're not as happy with just a 1% change. It's huge in, in industry. So, uh, you know, looking for these small, what might be considered small improvements uh, result in very large uh, cost changes. So I just want to give you an example. I think this is uh, pretty fun uh, that these quantum inspired optimization methods work so well. This is, uh, take a look at, you know, Seattle's traffic. BC has pretty darn bad traffic too. <laughs> uh, so equally this could apply here. Uh, take rush hour traffic, you wanna optimize it using QIO. And so just to drill home that these algorithms actually do work in practice, not just on synthetic, synthetic benchmarks. Um, with uh, QIO you can achieve roughly, you know, 50% uh, less congestion on the roads using this for, you know, a traffic routing scheme. Uh, and you can get about 8% shorter travel times. Uh, so, you know, in this case study, I'll just show you 5,000 vehicles starting from different locations across the city. And uh, let's say you just choose how many vehicles, uh, so this is a real demo uh, uh, recorded. <laughs> uh, 5,000 parameters you have, you give each vehicle the option of 10 different routes they can select between, uh, and then you can just run uh, run this traffic algorithm optimization. Uh, and this is work with um, Anita Ramanan, Francis Tibble, and Brad Lackey in our team, where uh, you can see just clearly the one on the right is better, right? So the amount of congestion is much higher on the left. Um, so QIO does in fact, uh, in fact work. So this is after 2,000 step, uh, steps of optimization. Um, now, you know, part of, uh, part of what's interesting, going back to the, you know, even earlier slide on cost function, uh, costing these algorithms, uh, these quantum inspired algorithms, you know, they work, work very well in practice. But what's, what's interesting is that these methods, when we want to convert them to a full quantum algorithm, we want to run them on full quantum hardware, um, inside that is, is a, a random walk in these algorithms. So if we want to run it on full quantum hardware, we can now take that random walk and we can replace it with a quantum walk, namely a Zegedee quantum walk, for example. Uh, and then, you know, in principle, this result, uh, this will result in a quadratic speed up. Okay, but we should rewind to what I said earlier, you know, that really needs to be dug into further to understand how much of a speed up that comes out in practice, right? When you run it on real hardware, the real device that you're gonna embed it onto, right, or into, um, that's important to drill into. So while in theory you get a quadratic speed up, it's important for whichever hardware you run that on, you really understand the actual cost, right? Uh, so I think this is a great, uh, a great thing to continue to probe. Uh, 
Uh, so quantum inspired goes to actual quantum algorithms uh, in these cases. So we know that there are applications for quantum algorithms, right? Bing traffic is one. <laughs> Um, uh, but making sure that the quadratic speed up is retained as classical hardware advances as well is really, really key. So we can also turn and look at quantum approximate optimization algorithms. And this has been another topic that's potentially of interest for NISC era, right? For actually seeing run on NISC era devices. But in recent, you know, Matt, uh, Matt Hastings is in our, in our, uh, in our group. And he walked down the hall, you know, a couple weeks ago before his paper came out. So, you know, Krista, I think I think I have a, you know this this idea that he worked out very quickly, <laughs> as Matt does, um, that shows you know QAOA isn't as good as we thought. And so the picture may be a bit bleaker in terms of QAOA being uh, something we actually run, you know, for uh, for value, if you will, in this era. So QAOA was thought um, to do better than the best classical algorithm on two benchmark problems, max3, lin2, and triangle3, max cut. Now, you know, as the history goes, there was kind of some back and forth, right? A team of classical algorithm uh, designers, you know, theorists came together and they, they showed that they could then outperform QAOA and then, you know, a better QAOA comes al along that performs, you know, almost as good or as well as that. Uh, and there's been this back and forth. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe it could perform kind of similarly well uh, to some of these classical approaches. Um, but what Matt has shown is that a very, very simple classical algorithm uh, can actually outperform QAOA. And essentially this algorithm is, um, I won't go into the details, but the classical algorithm is just this idea that you randomly choose uh, classical variables and you update them locally according, according to some of their neighbors. Um, update that uh, variable according to neighbors uh, locally, uh, depending on your objective function. And with this algorithm, he can show, for example, on the triangle tree max cut problem, um, he can show that it, it outperforms. So in this case, um, on this figure, you have horizontal axis, is essentially, it's, it's the degree of your graph, right? So you have some triangle-free graph. Um, so D is the degree. And then the vertical axis is, you know, a scaled, scaled improvement over the random, you know, random assignment, random solution. And you can see, uh, and, and in fact, it's scaled by square root of D. Um, and the classical algorithm here is termed threshold, it's the blue. And then the orange is the quantum, uh, the quantum, the QAOA algorithm. And so as you go out to large D, as the problem size grows, you know, asymptotically now, uh, you can see that the classical algorithm significantly outperforms uh, QAOA. Now, when you dive into his paper and the results in his paper, um, you'll see that there were there were a few degrees, uh, four, I think they were what three, four, six, and eleven when D equaled those numbers, uh, this algorithm didn't perform as well. Uh, but if you make a global update to the classical algorithm, immediately it then performs you know, better again. Uh, so, so interesting results there. Now the classical algorithm, if you want to read more about it, is in this archive paper here on the left. Uh, and of course it's detailed in Matt's paper as well. Um, so I think you know, there again, we need to continue to push on our algorithm designs, algorithm <coughs> optimizations to understand which algorithms are gonna be relevant, uh, both for NISC, but also for you know, the scalable world beyond. Now uh, in quantum machine learning, a series of papers in the last several months, um, you know, primarily from, from Tang, uh, showing that quantum inspired algorithms now uh, can outperform their quantum, uh, you know, their quantum counterparts. And this is exciting. Um, you know, I, I should share a story of, of my own research. We came up with, um, <coughs> several years ago in 2014, we, we came up with a machine learning algorithm, quantum machine learning algorithm, uh, that we thought was exponentially better uh, than, than the state-of-the-art classical algorithm. 
And within two weeks, you know, this was an internal, internal conversation, which we then published the papers, but I, I guess we didn't name them quite as well. Um, we then published that we actually found a better sampling, a classical sampling algorithm that we published in the classical machine learning literature uh, that, of course, reduced that exponential to just a quadratic improvement. Now, of course, this was, this was a positive because at Microsoft we need classical machine learning algorithms that work better than the state of the art uh, for our products. Uh, and so this was seen as a real positive, right? Not, not a loss that we no longer had an exponential improvement for quantum, but a gain that we had a better classical uh, state-of-the-art ML algorithm. Um, so these types of results um, are really important uh, and, uh, and you know, healthy for us to identify um, what actually will be the killer application for the quantum computer. And as I mentioned earlier, they're providing value uh, you know, to computing uh, solutions already today. So, you know, with that, um, oh, this didn't disappear, sorry. Uh, well, behind that is a graph, or is a circuit, um, which uh, we did some work now along with quantum machine learning, you know, knowing, uh, knowing this work and, and then thinking also, but, you know, still, are there some small quantum circuits we could run on, on small quantum hardware? and see interesting results. Um, we pursued uh, coming up with some low depth quantum circuits uh, to train uh, machine learning models for. And uh, in this case, doing supervised learning over two class uh, classification problems. This is work with Alex Blusherov, uh, Nathan Weeb, and Maria Schuld. Uh, so we, we looked at what we're calling circuit centric classifiers. <coughs> so you just have single and two qubit gates and you're gonna learn the parameters of those gates um, by doing a measurement and then doing a classical optimization, you know, a classical uh, gradient style update step and then feedback and then rerun. Uh, it's a variational uh, quantum circuit approach. And there, um, maybe I should just exit out of this so you can see the slide. Let me move these. Do this again. Real time editing. Okay, so now you can see the results. Uh, and so what's interesting is these models have only polylogarithmic number of parameters that you're training, whereas the classical model you're training has a linear or polynomial number of parameters you train per the, you know, scaling with the size of the input, polynomial in the, in the size of the input. So the quantum model ha only has polylog uh, <coughs> parameters in the size of the input. So one benefit of the quantum model is that it has so much, you know, so much uh, less, uh, less parameters, so many uh, fewer parameters to train. Uh, so here in the results, these are a bunch of standard ML uh, benchmarks, ML data sets uh, that people compare uh, different ML models against. Uh, QC is our quantum uh, model, our quantum circuit. Uh, ML, this is a neural net uh, based model, a neural network with some number of hidden layers, a linear number, then a shallow, and then a deep, a deep neural network there. And what I'm highlighting is that the quantum model can actually, you know, actually outperform significantly the neural nets in the case of the cancer data set. In the case of the sonar data set, it does almost as well um, with polylog parameters compared to polynomial parameters. So, you know, that's, that's I think, uh, of interest to understand how it's um, encoding and, and learning over that data. And the number of parameters ex is explicitly shown on the right where you know, cancer and sonar had 79 and 60 parameters. In those ML models, you had hundreds to thousands that were getting trained. Um, so you have a much more, you know, compact uh, and potentially this is interest, interesting from the potential of compression uh, of models uh, going forward. And then in, in my last several minutes, I want to talk about tools to actually do these types of studies. So how do we um, program our devices how do we study algorithms uh, and really do this optimization, understand the resources uh, more efficiently? And so there, uh, we've been working on something called the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. And this includes several, uh, several components, right, that really are, are here to help uh, the development of quantum algorithms, the optimization of quantum algorithms, and then the implementation of quantum algorithms. And so it includes Q Sharp, which is a quantum-focused programming language centered on programming for quantum algorithms. 
Um, it includes a whole extensive set of libraries and samples from which you can draw and build you know, new quantum algorithms from. Uh, includes development tools. It's available in VS Code, Visual Studio, runs on all platforms, um, you know, Mac, Linux, Windows. Um, extensive documentation and support, which is important when you're taking on a new language and a new package. Uh, and there's cross-platform development, as I just mentioned. So with this, Q Sharp itself has been designed with algorithms in mind, um, but those algorithms could be big or small. So this is equally you know, relevant and important for NISC-era devices and low-depth, short uh, quantum circuits, as well as you know, the scaled-up quantum chemistry-style algorithms I talked about in the beginning, uh, and of course, you know, many others. We've designed Q Sharp with the idea that we really want to make it easy to do cost or resource estimation. We want to make it easy, easier to debug quantum algorithms. So there's many layers of debugging one has to consider when, when developing uh, code. And uh, we, want, we want this to really drive new applications, optimized applications. We want the community to be involved in this process. And uh, we want this to help um, bring algorithms and, and circuits uh, to hardware. So the architecture is such that we have, you know, a quantum computer is really a hybrid, uh, hybrid device. It has classical control. And then it also has programs that includes both quantum instructions and classical instructions. So it's hybrid in multiple <coughs> senses. Um, and so you really do call the quantum operations and, and, and classical functions from a classical host program. The host, pro host program recently uh, we released uh, a new version that enables you to write that host program in Python, which makes it a lot easier to jump in uh, to learning Q Sharp. Uh, target machines, you can write your program and then you can target quantum hardware. You can target a simulator, <coughs> right? Simulate that um, quantum algorithm. And then a resource estimator, cost out how many gates, qubits, and operations. And there's lots of great packages available. So we have a new package with um, put out with Pacific Northwest National Lab that allows you to do uh, easier chemistry modeling. So you want to study FIMOCO or lithium hydride or you know whatever one you want uh, of any size, small or large. Um, there's a great package to do that and to study all of the different uh, chemistry algorithms there. Uh, so if you want to study, say, optimized qubitization uh, Hamiltonian simulation versus Trotter-based Hamiltonian simulation, you can do that in the tools. And here you can see just some different plots showing how the qubit, number of qubits vary, number of T gates varies, et cetera. Uh, we also have a very new release uh, with one qubit. We've partnered with one qubit to bring forward open chemist uh, connection to the Microsoft Quantum Chemistry Library. You can read more about open chemist uh, and um, our library and quantum development kit on uh, one qubit's blog. So this was just released May 31st just a week ago, uh, this platform. But what's nice here is, uh, especially for the NISC era, uh, these are small qubit type of algorithms. So this allows you to do a VQE type of programming and then you know, target your hardware, in this case, uh, you know, a solution that might have, in one case, 20 qubits, or if you do an optimization of that, just running on four qubits. So this, this is applicable you know, to, to the size hardware we have today. Of course, testing is important. Uh, so the quantum development kit uh, enables you to more easily debug uh, your operations. There's different ways to do that. You can dump diagnostic information about the qubit. And so for like a hardware level, uh, you can dump things like qubit ID or understand when it went wrong. Um, but then also at the program level, there's printfs, there's assertions and so forth, uh, plus documentation. Uh, and then, uh, really excited about the new release um, with uh, the quantum katas. These are little exercises to learn Q sharp. So, you know, katas being, you know, exercises you do in martial arts. Uh, the quantum katas are exercises you do in quantum programming. And uh, these are most recently available uh, in Jupyter. So you can go online in a web browser and, you know, in Binder, for example, um, learn uh, or teach someone about quantum programming. So this is great for coursework, um, but also if you're picking up the language fresh, uh, you know, right there in a Jupyter notebook, uh, in Binder, online in a web browser, uh, you can program and try, uh, try this, uh, these languages in the, in the development kit. So I encourage you to take a look at that. 
Uh, and now we are going open source. So look for uh, news coming soon on open sourcing uh, our compiler, our simulators, our library samples and katas so that all of you can get involved. We're really excited about uh, building an open source community, uh, enabling all of you to share ideas, code, and collaborate more easily. Uh, so in closing, you know, I think we're really just at the very beginning, uh, similar to you know, this picture of the ENIAC computing machine, 1946 at the University of Pen Pennsylvania, one of the first general purpose computers. So we all know, you know in, the, in this NISC era, we really are at the very beginning. Um, here I think programmers, you know, they sensed that this would change the world, but they didn't know exactly how. And they were running the most difficult problems of the day. In quantum, you know, we're, we're pushing and we're, I think, you know, probably feel similar to, you know, these people in this room. We know a few key applications uh, for when we have a scalable quantum computer, uh, but we need to continue to push to identify applications that may be valuable uh, for earlier uh, intermediate scale devices. So I, you know, I believe it's time to develop our quantum future together. I want to encourage us to think algorithms first. We can outpace Moore's law with algorithmic improvements. I want, uh, want us to think together how we can better train a broader community of people, software engineers and algorithm designers in particular, um, but I know we need people, material scientists, experimentalists, you know, measurement experts and so forth. So I think as a community, we, we, uh, we need to think more about that together. Find and optimize quantum algorithms and applications. Uh, we need to try out ideas on today's and tomorrow's hardware through simulation and then co-optimize these solutions. And with that, um, I'll close. Uh, thank you, Krista. Um, we have time for a few questions. Hi, um, thank you very much for your uh, very nice talk. Um, so I was wondering if Microsoft is uh, thinking of actually implementing an EWIN terms uh, algorithm. And um, my understanding is that it requires a very special uh, data structure. And uh, I wondered if you, if you think that that data structure is easy to implement in practice. Oh, for her classical, al yes. classical algorithm? Right, because you mentioned you were thinking among those Yeah, things. yeah. So you know, we've, um, we've looked at those recent uh, dequantized algorithms. Uh, you know, I think we have to dig into them more. In, uh, well, in, at first glance, the costs are high. Uh, so I think it's interesting, you know, they're, they're a good step, you know, along the way. I don't know that at present they're gonna outperform the heuristic style algorithms one has, for example, for recommendation systems. Um, the costs are much higher in terms of the, the complexity there. Um, but I think it's interesting to take those ideas and see where they plug into and if you can develop a practical classical ML algorithm from those. I guess uh, like the deeper question is kind of the, um, the data structure required for that algorithm to get the speed up is similar to some kind of QRAM, yeah. like a classical version of QRAM. So I was wondering if you think that was an easy way, like maybe if you thought that yeah, was realistic to implement. that's where it's still, it's still expensive uh, and so to make that practical, we have to dig in more. Yeah, great question, thank you. Somehow, um, your, your talk actually paints somewhat bleak future for, or at least near-term future for NISC <laughs> devices in terms of really kind of trying to see what quantum algorithms can really work. <laughs> and I have specific question about QA. So, is it really so, uh, this Matt's work is very interesting for sure, uh -huh. but is it really kind of, does it really, you know, bring a definitive conclusion about the prospects of QA specifically? Right. It is my understanding that his proofs are actually for circuit depth equals one. And, you know, the conjectures are for constant depth. Right, so, so, yeah. So it sounds to me like, you know, if we implement this QA with, you know, depth which scales even logarithmically with problem size, you know, these arguments do not apply. And I hope, certainly I hope we should be able to do better than that, you know. 
Yeah, so for the details on, you know, Matt's, uh, Matt's uh, you know, Matt should really answer this question because he has much better intuition than me uh, on this uh, precise, you know, precise question. Uh, but in general, you know, the thought at present, you know, as, you know, as Matt really is, you know, these classical algorithms, he quickly parameterized them, tuned them, uh, very quickly programmed them, and he can show that they outperform. And so in, in cases, you know, I think you're correct in that in the simulation, you know, quantum simulation, um, if we actually embed a problem into hardware for a very specific problem, this isn't saying that that won't outperform, um, you know, a Q, uh, well, that may outperform both QAOA and the classical algorithm, right? If you actually embed in an in a analog quantum simulator. But then that's designed specifically for, you know, that problem. So that's a hardened case. But in the more general QAOA versus classical algorithms, um, you know, I, I think, I think we're, we're all less optimistic that but QAOA I, is going to I'm actually I'm not so sure I fully agree, sorry, for, because it's yeah, an important point. So I think it's actually a little bit fair. more fundamental, you know, in that the question is really how much correlations you build with this QAOA. And, you know, to be, you know, honest to me, you know, the fact that, you know, something with circuit depth of one you know, can even do, you know, s you know, something useful would be completely amazing. So, but, you know, cer and certainly, you know, for, I mean, I can also see for constant depth uh, how these yeah. arguments can propagate, but certainly if you scale the depth of circuit with your systems size, I, I do not believe that any of these arguments, you know, apply. So I think for, you know, in those systems, I would certainly, I yeah. hope very much that this near term machines, you know, which you will not be able to simulate can really teach us something. Yeah, that's great. I'll pass, pass your comments on to Matt and encourage the two of you to have a happy. conversation. I'm happy to talk to you. Great, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> One last question in the back. Um, more a comment than a question. Um, Microsoft has been promoting nitrogenase as a killer application for a while. Um, but um, last year, there was a team at Princeton University that showed that you can use light instead of high heat. You can use light at room temperatures to um, help dissociate the molecule. So it may not be a killer application anymore. Yeah, so that's one, um, you know, one example of an application of the broader Hamiltonian simulation algorithms. And I think, you know, I think you, um, you know, a good point is raised that, and, and that I was actually trying to also raise in the talk, is that we have to constantly kind of be on our toes, right? Looking at the best classical solutions, uh, throwing the best classical hardware, classical solutions, that's going to be true of the chem chemistry applications, materials applications, machine learning, optimization. And we, you know, we, we really need to throw all that in when we do these benchmarks and comparison to make sure we're still better and have a quantum advantage against the best, the state of the art. So, you know, no doubt there could be breakthroughs um, in carbon capture and nitrogen fixation uh, in all these different methods, um, which again is a wonderful, wonderful thing for us, right, to have such breakthroughs um, as, as quantum, uh, you know, as the quantum community, we need to continue to identify new, I think, application areas for quantum computers uh, and continue pushing on that. So, you know, indeed, there are advances on the chemistry side. Um, you speak to one, and I think, you know, in the next, you know, in the many, you know, in the years before we have a, a machine that can scale to that size, uh, there are likely to be others. And so, so we need to just continue to carve out the right, uh, right application areas for quantum computers and, and know what their true advantages are. Uh, so I think your, your comment hopefully further uh, supports uh, the message uh, I was hoping to get across. Thank you. All right, let's thank Krista again.